Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. Greetings, good morning, and please have a seat. There are intertwining themes going on today in the epistle and gospel. The themes are salvation and also Christ's second coming. And I say that they're intertwined because the Bible teaches us that those who accept Christ as Lord and Savior receive salvation and that we will be raised from the dead and united with God at the time of Christ's second coming for eternity. The second coming of Christ is sometimes referred to as the eschaton, as in eschatology, that that will come again, second coming, or also as parousia, fancy names for the second coming of Christ. And it's also what Paul addressed today in the epistle and Jesus talked about in the gospel. But it was this misunderstanding that they had to address. The misunderstanding that people had about the actual timing of Christ's second coming and how our worldly understanding versus the spiritual reality would change when humanity was reunited with Christ in glory. The Apostle Paul and many others use language that could have been interpreted by listeners as Christ's arriving imminently, although Paul never actually said that. He didn't say, get ready, Jesus is coming now, versus now later, as I told the children. In his correspondence with the Thessalonians, Paul warned them to beware of the rumblings that were going on, initiated by some of the local preachers and teachers here and there, who were saying that Christ's timing would be now, now. The stories of readiness for Christ's second coming did not only come from the Bible for me, but also from my Pentecostal grandmother, who would reprimand me by saying that if I kept it up, Jesus would leave me behind now, now. <laughs> Gotta love grandma. <laughs> I can see how for the Christ followers in Thessalonica, for my grandmother, and for Christians who today proclaim that the time is near, to misinterpret the immediacy of that timing. So one of the issues that Paul had to readdress with the earliest Christians was this complacency that they were falling into about daily living and their moral and ethical behaviors due to that understanding of time regarding Christ's second coming. The interpretation and understanding of chronos, or chronological time, versus kairos, or God time, reminds me of my childhood when mom would call out, as I told the kids, comida, in Spanish, dinner, or I would say, voy, coming, well, you know, in Spanish, as in English, voy implies that one is on one's way. Now, now. But then there's the concept in Spanish of ahora and ahorita, which literally is sort of now, now, and now later. It's sort of gray area. Don't we live in that gray area? So I was going to come for dinner, but the question was, was whether that was now, now, or now, later. You know, the thinking of early Christ followers regarding Christ's second coming was significantly different from yours or mine. They believed in one coming of the Messiah, not a first coming and a subsequent return, as we know it. One of Paul's daunting tasks, which as we know today was successfully achieved, was to teach early Christians to understand that the death and resurrection of Christ was a way for human sin to be redeemed through an initial rite of cleansing. We call that baptism. 
Additionally, belief in Christ through discipleship and learning plus righteous behavior would lead all to salvation. Paul was big into righteous behavior, as has been discussed by those who are attending the adult beer and Bible study. But for Paul, those ingredients were imperative for reunification with Christ in glory eternal. That moral and ethical teaching was hard, fast, was burned into his heart, probably because the first time in his ministry, he wasn't so clear about that. So why was the second coming easy for the new Christ followers to accept? Because they did accept it. The concept of eschatology, that second coming, was not foreign to Jews in general, is not foreign to Jews today. On the contrary, they believe in the coming of a Messiah and in an afterlife in glory, as long as they remain accountable to the Lord as righteous, faithful, and law-abiding people. No different than our understanding. But while Jesus was still alive, his own disciples were confused about the first and second coming issues. Those separate events were not very clear yet. They couldn't grasp the fact that in his first coming, Jesus would die for the redemption of human sin. Even after Jesus' resurrection, during those 40 days with him, the apostles still did not completely understand that Jesus was to establish his kingdom at the next coming. They still thought that he would immediately fulfill the messianic prophecies that they had learned in the Torah, in the Old Testament. So perhaps the timing of Christ's return was also unclear for Paul, a good Jew. When he called out, dinner is ready, everyone lined up, now, now. So he had to clarify in his subsequent letters the distinction of Kairos time, God time, and urge them to continue living upright lives so that they could be reunited with Christ. I could see how the people questioned how their behavior, you know, the next day, the next week, or even the next month, would preclude them from earning a place in heaven if Jesus was coming soon. What's the issue? He's about to come. You know, what could I do between now and next month that's going to keep me from being chosen? And Paul said, and perhaps confused folks with this too, Jesus will come like a thief in the night. Is that now, now, or now later? He also told them what to expect before Christ's coming when he said, watch for the lawless one to be revealed. The lawless one. In other words, the power of evil has to show its ugly head in the world before Christ will come again. Well, that's a little vague. Given the world that we live in, wouldn't you say that Paul's statement about the evil one showing its ugly head would leave you wondering why Christ hasn't already shown up? I mean, let's just use a few examples. You have the Crusades, and there's a lot of stuff that happened before that. Let's go with the Crusades, slavery, concentration camps, apartheid, Rwanda, the Twin Towers. A few examples of the evil one showing its ugly head in the world. And where's Jesus? As I said earlier, the evil one showing its ugly head could be a pretty vague indicator. How would you know to distinguish today the revelation of evil given the evil that has already happened in the world? You would think that after so much human disaster that Jesus would have already arrived. But no, we're still here. Not yet. Now, later. The Sadducees, in today's reading from Luke, asked Jesus a next life or eschatological question 
which they didn't really believe in, from their perspective of life events versus spiritual realm realities. And that life event had to do with marriage. They asked a legitimate question that sounds to me like a riddle, which came from their understanding of the law and the Torah. When the husband of a woman died, his brother was to marry her, hopefully procreate. But what if she married the brother and he died, and the next one died, there were seven of them. They all died, no children. In the second coming, whose wife would she be? That's the riddle part. Jesus' response was an explanation of human events versus spiritual events in glory. So that in the next life, the concept of being married to anyone or being the daughter or the son of anyone changes because we are all children of God, as the British would say, full stop. I wonder whether you talk with anyone or give some thought about the end of time in your daily lives. It's not a common conversation to have. Boy, if you do that in the next beer and Bible, it'd be interesting to hear what people have to say. I'm not referring to the time of your death, though. I'm re referring in this case to the time of your resurrection. Do you talk about your resurrection? What do you believe happens after death? And what informs that belief? Are we all going to be lined up, also known as the rapture? Most Anglicans do not believe in a select few chosen for salvation. And I say most Anglicans, I want to cover myself here, some might. We are the Via Media people. Most believe that Jesus will return on a day which no one expects and which is known to no human. On that day, Jesus will resurrect all who have died. He will judge the living and the dead. Our creed tells us so. And Jesus will fulfill his promise of eternal life to all who believe in him. This occurs as one event and not in a rapture or pre-glorification setting in which the fixed number of believers are lined up so that they can make the cut. Salvation is for all, says the Lord. That's a promise. And it's not just me saying it. It was said by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts of the Apostles, Paul's letter to Romans, Corinthians, Ephesians, Hebrews, some of the pastoral letters, 1 Peter, 1 John, and also in Revelation. Is that enough? Lots of Bible stories or chapters in there. Is the next life in glory relevant to your day-to-day -day life? Do you feel the need to be accountable about your life to someone or something? If so, to who? Or to what? Why? Why not? I'm going to plug Carlos's beer and Bible study again, because I believe that whether one drinks Diet Coke, soda water, beer, a glass of wine, that a Bible study gives us a chance to process some of these theological issues on which Christianity is founded and our faith develops. Talking, talking things through will give you a perspective, maybe your perspective founded on what someone shares. You create a perspective and question God and talk to the children of God. I have another eschatological perspective that I would like to invite you to ponder. Do you find hope and love in the mystery of Christ's coming again? Is there hope and love in the unknown fact that Christ will come again? Is that concept foreign or accessible to you. If you were going to convince someone who didn't have a formed Christian perspective about Christ's second coming, how would you explain it? Or better yet, how would you convince them that there will be a second coming? All these questions, they'll be on the website so you can review them. 
My last question for you to reflect on this week is how you live your life today so that you know in your heart that you will join Jesus in glory at his second coming. How do you know? How do you live your life today so that you know in your heart that you will join Jesus in glory at his second coming? Lots of questions. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.